sponsoring or, or creating or, or uh, giving us the opportunity to be here today. So Inspire's mission is to support mental health of children, youth, and their families. And the mission is a community that empowers children, youth, and families to experience and recognize their strengths, resources, and potential, and that supports their overall well-being. Who we are, a little bit more about Inspire. Uh, some of the programs, oh, the programs aren't listed there, but incorporated nonprofit. Something exceptional. It's a great, great organization. So what is an IEP? It's funny, I've said it a million times today already and didn't say individual education plan. The world is full of acronyms and abbreviations and sometimes I feel like a fool when I say, what does that stand for? Um, ask, always ask. Uh, and I might do it today if I say some phrase or abbreviation, like you said, what's the classroom group name that your son was in? It's three letters, again, you know, sometimes it's important that we, we ask, so individual education plan. The purpose of an IEP is to make sure that everybody is on the same page. The purpose that, as a parent, looking at an IEP is that you want to know what the school is doing with your child. Uh, you want to know what they're working on, what's coming up next, and that they're making progress. An IEP is not supposed to be a one-time thing forever. There should always be comments or, or measurable increments that the child is attaining. Even if it's tiny and it's over a long period of time, there's some sort of a goal. Uh, because neurotypical kids have their education a little bit more cut out for them where grade one we learn this, and in grade two we learn this. Whereas a kid who has an IEP might learn some things much faster and need, or slower, and need to have a plan. Um, and in between those years and the summers, when the staff change and the support people change, an IEP can guide people to allow that learning to hopefully continue without too much of a big bump in the middle, versus at the beginning of that new school year having to start from scratch again. So IEPs can actually carry over between school years because it's not always a cut and dry beginning and end. Um, are all IEPs the same? Definitely not. I forgot to say at the beginning how many IEPs I've been to. Angela asked me if she thought I knew how many IEPs I've been to. So. As a child development counselor for seven years, I went with several of the kiddies I supported, but only the first IEP, and then we closed, and the school took over. But then as a family service worker for 13 years, um, I get invited to about 50 or 60 IEPs every fall and 50 or 60 every spring, and I can't go to all of them because a lot of them are at the same time as other things. So if I go to 50 a year over 13 years, that's a lot of IPs. Um, and the majority of them were in the Winnipeg School Division because the way that my employer separates who I support is by geographical area. So I'm now in a different position that I support the whole city for a more narrow uh, clientele, I guess. But already this week, I've been to one IEP in East St. Paul, and I'm going to one in St. Norbert soon. So it sounds silly to have IEPs this early, but rarely it's rarely this early in the school year, but some do. IEPs are usually October, sometimes November. December's too late. Um, so that's, yeah. If you feel that the child and the school, that the whole team would benefit from um, starting to build um, or tweak the IEP that was put in place at the end of the previous year to tweak it for the current year based on say some stuff that's happened over the summer holidays. Um, could you request an IEP you a request little a bit earlier? It doesn't have to be an IEP. An individual education plan should be something formal. It should have an invitation sent so that everybody that you feel is important and that the school feels is important to your child's support team in the school and maybe outside the school are invited. An IEP should be something a little bit formal. There is nothing wrong with ever requesting a support meeting or a touch base meeting between you and just the teacher or you and the special ed resource teacher. Um, just to say, hey, look, I've brought this from last year. Remember when we were talking about sorting? He's mastered that over the summer, just to let you know. And I think after sorting, we were going to start looking at this. So could you start there instead of restarting at the sorting? You can, you can always share your feelings um, mm -hmm. in writing or informally. Not so informally that it's quick, quick at pickup time where you're trying <laughs> to get your, your important words in. 
by that pickup time, you can say, hey, tomorrow when I drop Johnny off, can I come five minutes earlier because I want to show you something. Ask permission to have time given to you to share those things. Or for a formal sit-down meeting over a lunch period for just a short time. Mm -hmm. But it's always okay to ask for that kind of contact. And it's, it takes some bravery to do that sometimes because you're asking for uh, I'll sit down again after Angela. <laughs> because we have the, the teacher, the special ed resource teacher, the, the, the EA, we've got the principal, the vice principal, the OT, the PT, the speech language pathologist, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the physiotherapist, and the custodian, no, not the custodian, but, <laughs> but that, that, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Yeah. When I label that, that is common at an IEP uh, to have a crowd. And even though you're not all sitting here like the parent with all these people looking at you, I can imagine it must feel like that. Um, or the opposite, where you feel like you're an outsider and all these people are there to talk about your kid in this schooly type way and you're not included. Um, walk in and try not to have your feelings hurt and your ears open and bring a support person. He brought an advocate. Bring your mom, bring your neighbor, even if you know it's a friend that might not be part of your child's education plan. It's somebody else for you to be walking home with after and say, oh my gosh, what did they say about gym class again? Just to talk about it and say, you know, then, then you know that teacher's walking out with the cert and they're gonna be talking about, oh, okay, so what are we doing about that plan? You're gonna walk out and say, okay, you know what? You have somebody to share that with. So try to bring somebody with you. Um, it's, it's, it's an important thing, I think. And along the same lines as that, you know, because you mentioned so you can have someone to talk about it with as you're walking home yeah. or whatever. So along that same same line so that you can go over some stuff, um, I tend to take a lot of notes and ask a lot of questions. You're doing part of the presentation for me. Shut <laughs> <laughs> up, this is true. And, and, and talking about things afterwards is a normal thing to do and it doesn't always have to be because it's stressful or a crisis or huge exciting. Uh, you debrief about stuff. Right. What I was going to ask, though, is along with having someone there who yeah. can hear things that you might miss or and asking a lot of questions and taking a lot of notes, um, just like um, with recording other things, um, is it okay if you get the permission of everybody that's at the IEP meeting to actually record it so that you can go back even just for your own self as a secondary to written notes, because I'm a very visual person. Yeah, I think it's always okay to ask, and I think that they would often feel weird saying no, but it would be awkward. It would feel weird. Um, I haven't seen that happen ever. I, I think if you're a visual learner, it's hard, but if there's any way you could do it just auditorily, it would feel less intimidating if you asked if you could do a voice recording of everything. Well, that, yeah, you? sorry, that's what I meant. I mean a yeah. voice recording. Yeah, so that that would feel more comfortable because a lot of times people are uncomfortable being looked at yeah. in a video. You know, like, an, where like the auto note clip or something. Yeah. Yes, so that's okay. And I would always ask and not do it in a sneaky way, but I think asking is important. Okay. Yeah. So what to expect in an IP? We've all been to one or two, but they're all very different. So I'm not going to go through this in too long. The room full of people, like that gigantic room I talked about, that's common and that's a good thing. I've been to IEPs where I walk in and it's me and the mom and one school person. And I feel sad because this is a team that we're supposed to be all talking about what the plan is. And this is not certainly the whole team if there's just one person here. Um, and how do I know that the other people here are going to have the time and the heart to read the bits that we're talking about today? Um, so I would always go with a good attitude and sit down and say, at the next meeting, can we invite the physiotherapist? You've mentioned them a few times, and I'd really love for them to be here. So ask, ask for those sorts of things. Uh, and introduce yourself. It seems silly when they go around the room and introduce themselves, and you go, I'm Christina, I'm the mom. But do it, and that's your chance to say something a little bit more, and to get the flavor of who you are in all of their ears as well. I'm Christine, I'm Sawyer's mom, and I'm so excited. He's in grade five, how did this happen? And then next person. Just to see something a little, something nice and human, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice thing. So bring a support person we already talked about. Should the student be present? Occasionally the student is there. Occasionally the child is part of the IP. And the first time that happened to me where the student was there and it was a man-sized student, he was a big boy, and I thought, is he going to be here when we're talking about him and we're making all these plans? And for that situation, it was right. It was good and it was beneficial. 
Um, so the flexibility to have the student there should be, I think, based on that, whether the, the student is comfortable and whether the parent thinks the student is comfortable. And that's another opportunity for you to be brave and say, I'm glad we all met Mark, but I think it's best if Mark is not here for the rest of the meeting. Okay, son? Um, be, be brave if that's what you really feel. Um, it's, it's rare, but it, it happens occasionally that the student is there. Uh, there might be handouts. Most IEPs, there is an actual individual edu education plan document that's handed out at the beginning of the meeting that the school will ask the parent to sign. It's a document that stays in the child's file and the file will be passed along with them. Whether anybody reads that in the future, who knows? It certainly doesn't follow them to their career and their university entrance application, um, but it stays in there. So often and most times the school has a formal IEP form that they format that they follow and it is not standard within any one particular school division or school. Um, and in there, it'll, 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 it, there's usually two or three columns saying where the child is at today, what the next goals are, and how much improvement there will be. Currently, uh, Matthew is, is, is um, giving eye contact one out of every five times that he's requested to do so. By March 2018, he will give eye contact three times out of five every time he's requested to. So usually in an IEP, there is something handing, handed out that has measurable goals in it. And you would be surprised how many times that March 2018 that we don't refer back to see has that goal actually been attained. Because when we meet again in March, there'll be another handout. And sometimes when you look at the two, you can, you, you can see they didn't look at number one when they were writing the new one, number two. So it's important to keep your documents together. And that's why there are binders here. Life is crazy and chaotic. You're busy thinking about groceries on the way home. And when your child is coming home, stick it in the binder, stick it in a drawer. You'll know where it is. And, March when you need to find it again. Go ahead. Um, just as, as a very brief, um, Yay Harold Hatcher Elementary School, what they tend to do so that it, they do um, refer back is what they'll do is they'll put the previous IEP up and the person will be actually, you know, deleting parts and redoing it. So they're actually just, they're actually revising the actual document itself. So very good. I love that, just that's a little, yay. <laughs> so I want to expect as far as length of time, some schools that I go to, when they call me to go to an IEP, I know I'm gonna be there for 20 minutes because there's a five minute break and the next kid. And all those staff sitting at the table often are sitting there for the whole day. Um, so they're tired and they're weary by the end of the day. Um, and walking in as a family service worker, I'm only there for 20 minutes for some schools. Other schools, I know it's an hour and a half. Uh, one's not better than the other, it's just how they function at those different places. So you can ask, how, how long is this uh, time scheduled for? Ask questions or write them down. We already know that. Um, ideas of, uh, so, so some ideal conference, uh, the I ideal conference, a teacher's perspective. So instead of starting with what's wrong, Kathy is very unhappy in your class. She says you always criticize her. Instead, start by describing something right. Kathy tells me she likes helping you pass out papers. So this is getting into the attitude part that I'm talking about. We're walking into a very clinical, sort of factual, maybe functioning type of meeting, but consider your attitude when you're going in and how you're phrasing things because you may be going in with that one thing in mind that I am tired of him coming home with snot crusted around his nose and I really want to get it onto that or why are we still spelling his name when he's spelled his name already three months ago you're going in excited with that point that you want to share but consider the the point of the the staff hearing your words as well that it does it seems frivolous to say something kind of positive first but but make the effort, you know. Um, you know, you guys are so busy all day that, 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 you know, I know he's got a runny nose a lot of the times, but he's having so much fun and you guys are so busy, you know, taking care of his awesome gross motor skills that he's gained over the last few months. But can we talk about the snot or can we talk about the name spelling? So try and put a positive spin on things rather than just barging in there with your, um, your concern. Ideal for, uh, conference, the teacher's perspective, the first one I laughed at too. Instead of telling me what to do, share what has worked at home. You shouldn't, you shouldn't give Kathy such long reading assignments. 
Or, Kathy seems less overwhelmed when she has only a few pages to read each night. Uh, so the wording is very similar, but it comes across very differently. And you're going in not with the attitude that you're fighting for your child, but that you want to build, you want to build a good plan. So consider how you're, you're phrasing things. Knowing the language, know the language of what's being said in the room. Um, it's it's just like advocacy, right? We're advocating for our child and to have a good plan. It's it's a language that those people sitting at the table use all the time. Don't feel sad or intimidated if you don't know what acronyms are. Nobody is supposed to know them all, and anybody else at the table didn't know them all at the beginning of their career sitting at that table either. Um, some phrases are more politically correct than others, and if there's a phrase going around the table that the professionals are using that you feel uncomfortable with, I'd share that after. Um, if they're using outdated phrases, it might be a school that's never supported a person with a disability, and they're saying that the child has a handicap. You know, maybe that was okay to, to say when they themselves were in school, but they maybe are new to supporting somebody, so they may need to have some guidance in their own phrasing as well. So developmental disability, developmental delay, global developmental delay, uh, diagnosis or labels such as autism spectrum disorder, Down syndrome, etc. You always say the person first and I find that that's one um, difference, not mistake necessarily, that still commonly is said amongst people that work supporting individuals. Uh, where they'll say, uh, yeah, you know, Jack is, Jack is autism. No, he's, he isn't autism. Jack, you know, Jack, Jack's been diagnosed with autism, but he, he, he is also a boy, he is also Canadian, he is also tall, like, he's a lot of things, so let's not say, uh, yeah, oh, autistic Jack up the hall is different than our, than, than Sally. Like, we always say the, the, the name first, and then if we need to say the Are you gonna get a slap on the wrist? Because I prefer diagnosis first. Go for it. Yeah. I, I say I'm, I'm an ASPE, my son's an ASPE, he's autistic. Sure, and I think that that flexibility is different when you're speaking about your own self or your own... And I actually have, have requested that the school refer to them that way. Okay, yeah, everybody's different. So it, it's not gonna... But you're also not giving them a, words to say that are insulting, like the R word or... or oh yeah, or, no, no, no. <laughs> or lazy, or you're, you're yeah. not saying yet, to, to, you're not saying to, to give them labels that are bad. So, yeah, yeah to use their own. IQ, we know what that means. DQ is developmental quotient. So it's a measure of intelligence that you may hear professionals use. Uh, IQ is something that's difficult to or not really tested in children, but DQ, developmental quotient, is. So a developmental quotient is also a number on a scale of one to whatever, uh, usually 100 and something. Uh, it determines a child's cognitive ability only. It doesn't incorporate a lot of developmental areas. Is that something psychological? Yes, okay. Yeah, they're they are. Yeah. yeah, so the psychological assessments uh, where they assess for cognitive ability as well as adaptive functioning and adaptive skills okay. don't often result in a number. Um, correlated on there directly, but when you're applying for funding, they're correlated. Uh, uh, school funding levels, one, two, and three. So within our school divisions, children sometimes are assigned support and on a level one, two, and three. Level one is uh, uh, no direct one-to-one -one support person. So they're not gonna get an educational assistant supporting them in the class, but they do get additional supports. Like they may get a little bit of pull-out time and uh, get assessed by an occupational therapist, physiotherapist, or speech-language pathologist if needed. They'll have their file open as a child with a disability, so that if they need to have school social work or school psychology involved, those doors are open, um, and they will be able to have an IEP. Le level two is a half-time funded person. So it's a child who has a half-time funding of an EA, so if, uh, that's half a day. If they're in kindergarten and kindergarten is only half a day, they would have the funding the whole time that they're there, not half of that half a day. It's half a day funding. Uh, a level two funded student sometimes is paired with another kid in the class who also has level two funding, and then that one EA will be able to support the two kids as needed. So that's sometimes a way of covering those gaps or, or getting a bit more support. Level three is support for a child who has a full-time EA, a full-time one-to-one support person. Sometimes these levels of funding are assigned for a year, but usually it's for a few years. Um, not not in kindergarten. Kindergarten often kids will get a level two or less, 
but come grade one when they've already been able to see what the child is able to do and what they need support doing in grade in kindergarten then they'll assign some level one two or three for the next couple of years and that is often determined and shared at the second IEP of the year what the child's funding level will be for the following years um, it's very difficult to fight and argue and get those levels changed um, but it's possible level three being the highest in order to get that level three funding often kids need to have well they do need to have a very high need uh, support level need meaning they need to be a student who doesn't use the bathroom not always sometimes it's a person that can use a bathroom but has other high needs but if you wear diapers um, cannot walk independently and need help to transfer and move um, and have very high uh, safety needs where there's aggression and harming yourself and or others those are often pretty easy to get a level three funding not an automatic nothing's automatic in the school system but those are the if, if you if you were to say to me your child is is, is still toilet learning wearing diapers is nonverbal um, uses some sort of assistive technology to move and is aggressive towards themselves or others they'll have a level three that's a no-brainer it's it's the it's the kiddies that can walk can use the bathroom but they need to be told um, and they need to be reminded of the steps involved um, they need somebody to verbally help them work situate through situations so that they don't need to bang their heads to make them their way through it or that they don't need to bite others to make their way through it if they had somebody to verbally walk them through they wouldn't be doing these things but without it then they do this is the this is the harder the harder times to yeah is that the same with the new funding model it is not okay the new this funding model, the model is not all it's it, it it's not it's not in all schools yet and there's word that it may be reversed and we're just going to stay with the level one two and three we're not we're not sh we're not sure yet <laughs> but the new funding level frightens me because it's similar to the way that daycare supports changed five or six years ago uh, where before a child with a disability need would just get a one-to-one -one worker and the daycare would get extra funding to pay for that staff that changed five or six years ago where no more the kid was assessed and oh you get two and a half hours of support you know the kid is there for eight hours like what so similar the school system is now going through this transition where they're going to look at the child's need level and give an amount of time but how do you hire one person to be there um, just before she has a meltdown and to recognize those signs and only during math because that's challenging and only at recess because that's challenging it's very difficult so I don't know how that's gonna work Go ahead. yeah that's one thing that I worry about not so much with my Son, because he or she automatically got him level three. <laughs> well, and, and but for my daughter, yep. she she had I believe the highest they were able to get for her because of the way that she presents. Because yep. um, she's more she more internalizes. Okay. Um, and she's very easy to miss in the classroom. Sure. She, she's a wallflower. Yep. Anyway, is they got her level two. Okay. But with this new funding, that is one thing that I worry about is because she has mild meltdowns every single day yeah. but it changes from day to day when yeah. so if you've got a EA who's scheduled to be there from when she comes in at 8 30 until lunchtime yeah well what if she doesn't you know or also she's not potty trained yeah. not completely potty trained she's half potty trained and so you know yeah yes everybody's got some what ifs that's for sure and it, so I, I mean ideally it, it, it's gonna work well in one way because like I said sometimes a child who has level two funding there'll be two of those funding assessed level kids in the same room with one adult helping them so now this opens the door to maybe even having you know there's a few kids in the room where you wouldn't necessarily pick out anybody has a diagnosis of anything but there's an extra adult in the room who always has their eye on maybe three kids maybe maybe three kids in this room and one in the other room she's got her he she or he has her ear so potentially it's a, potentially it's a good thing potentially we're going to be able to get some support for kids who haven't had support before at all yeah. um, or, or, or they had support half the day and nobody the other half of the day would I be able to talk to you to, at, at a different time about sure. my, my daughter because yes. I, I believe she needs level three not level two okay yeah yeah and you said it's very hard to get them changed, so I'm, you know, it is. asking you we can lean what on kind of red tape yeah. I need to go through. <laughs> oh, Angela locked herself out there, I think. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and EA is an educator.
educational assistant. It's a person who has uh, special skills supporting an individual who has a disability diagnosis or autism spectrum disorder in the classroom and the school environment as a whole. Uh, people who are EAs have all sorts of experience. Some have experience raising lots of children in their own family, maybe with typical needs, maybe with not typical needs. Some have training and degrees that they got in Canada or elsewhere and have lots of experience to share. And I love EAs. I think that they're one of the most important parts of the whole support piece, support puzzle, because they're the one that will know the child the most and spend the most time with them. And they'll be the one that's trying to implement the suggestions that all these different people are giving them, sometimes verbally, not verbally, parent suggestions, things they heard on the news, so it's a very important job, very important. A CERT special ed resource teacher. So a special ed resource teacher is a person paid within a school, not the full school division, who oversees the, 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 the EAs and the plans that are put in place for each child that those EAs are supporting. Uh, so it's not a teacher in front of a classroom, it's a person paid within the school that is coordinating all sorts of plans and appointments and, and staff as well. SLP is a speech language pathologist, OT is occupational therapist, PT is physiotherapist. Some schools have in-house where the, the therapy teams will only support a couple of schools, so they're there all the time. Other schools don't, and they have uh, OTs and PTs and SLPs stop by for a few minutes every couple weeks. It depends what school what school your child is in. IEP, we said what that is. And then there's all kinds of classroom labels, whether it's an adapted class, a modified program, an individualized program. Don't ask me to explain the difference because there's so much overlap between them all, really, that it, it really comes down to what is your child uh, doing and how, how is this program adapted, what is being modified. And there's lots of others too, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, so there's like I talked about beginning at, at the beginning. There's certain phrases and language that are that, that are not acceptable anymore, and we don't need to get into that again here. But um, modeling, you know, and even today, if I'm saying something that's not appropriate, don't be afraid to correct me. Attitude, we touched on a little bit. Um, it's one of the most important things. It's 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 about being an example for your child even though they may not be in the room. How you present to the other adults that are supporting your child is very important. Uh, you get what you give. So if you're kind and friendly and suggestive, but directive and clear, that's the kind of information you'll get back as well. But if you're very vague and too gentle and too quiet, sometimes you don't get back that same sort of information that you're hoping to hear. So think about how you're speaking and how you're presenting and how you're preparing. Consider the phrasing. Uh, in written communications especially. In this modern world of, of Facebook and messaging and texting, some parents are starting to be able to text and email the teacher. Don't forget, we're not raised in a, in a land of texting and messaging. None of us are. We're of, a, we're, of, we're of a verbal, my mom would get a phone call if I was naughty, or I would call the school, my mom would call the school if, if I was sick. Times have changed and in our lives, we need to remember that when we're writing a message, People can't hear our tone of voice. So if I'm writing a message that I'm smiling while I'm writing it and it is meant to be pleasant, just double read before you push send because sometimes it's too short and too curt and it's taken as rude. Uh, not just clear and short. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Good idea. Uh, take a breath, step away, ask for a moment if you need, if things get heated. So you have to take care of yourself and if things are going on that it just feels overwhelming to you, I can't tell you how many times a parent has cried in an IEP because a lot of times we talk about hard things. Um, we talk about the challenges, we talk about the incidents that maybe the parent didn't hear about. Um, and, and why didn't you tell me that he had three meltdowns last week? And it breaks people's hearts. And then they, a parent might get emotional and then I start to cry with them usually. Um, but ask for a moment, calm down, go to the washroom, come back. Don't leave the school and go home, it's not a good idea. But take a moment and step back. Take a breath, say, I'm just having feelings right now, and I'll be right, and I'll be right back. Um, sometimes they don't always share everything before the meetings because they're saving this information to tell you at the meeting. So you may be surprised at some of the things you hear, and, 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 and you know, you'll need to take a minute, just take a breath. 
If you feel that you're not being heard, be persistent, but polite. Uh, there's an agenda at the meeting and they may have forgotten to write you into the agenda because they may not have known that you had something important that you needed to share and that your goal, your number one goal for your child is this. And I don't see it anywhere in this IEP and now I'd like to share why this is my goal for my child. And they all need, may be looking at their watches, but be a little bit persistent. Give it, give, give it even, give yourself a time limit. I'm just gonna talk for the next two, three minutes because I've brought this note for myself to share. This is my goal for my child. And I'm hoping that you can help my child to learn this maybe halfway by March or whatever language they're using. Um, be real and be honest. It's, it's you know, there's, you, don't, you only get to do an IEP once or twice. Usually it's twice every school year, fall and spring. So it's, you know, it's a, it's, a t it's a chance to flex your bravery and to be honest and forward and ask for what you need. Uh, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar is the phrase. Yep. So I always put that on there at the end. Gotta, it's true. Gotta be sweet. Step one, get organized. Have your binder, collect your stuff. It doesn't have to be organized in the binder, but know where it is so that the night before when everybody's asleep, if they sleep, uh, you can get it ready, peek through it. Hi, <laughs> <I> here. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Get your binder the night before. Don't worry about preparing weeks and weeks before if you can't, but at least the night before. Get it out, peek through. Don't read everything, but look and see, okay, what the heck have I shoved in here? Something from the doctor two months ago? I don't know if I'll need to talk about that. Okay, this was last time's IEP. Uh, what was the main goal? Stick it in there. You don't have to study it and be an expert on every paper that you're bringing, but bring what you can. Put it in the rings the night before, and you'd be surprised how many times you have the opportunity to go, Yes, he did have his eyes checked two months ago, and look, typical, or <laughs> yes, we do have a card coming up. When is this here and getting tested? Oh yeah, look, November 18th. Yep, you can come. And you know, keep all your papers together. You'd be surprised how many times they are not gonna come in handy. Uh, keep them in the binder. F find a place at home for the binder that the binder stays. So that when you walk back in from the meeting, stick it on the fridge or wherever it's not gonna get colored on and shredded. And that's where it stays. That's the drawer or that's the shelf. And as things come in the mail or pulled out of your purse at whatever appointment you were at, stick it there. And then when you have a moment in life, you can organize it. But don't just have the binder, have the binder live somewhere. Um, especially for business cards. You'll, you'll be at this IEP with all these people around. Ask for cards from people because I wouldn't demand them. But I mean, if somebody says something that really tweaks your interest about uh, Boy, that guy sure does seem like he knows my daughter, and he really was saying that interesting thing about how her foot is. Can I get your card? I might want to send you an email later. Stick it in the binder. Stick it in the drawer. Right on the back of the card as you're leaving the meeting. Uh, that was the guy with the short brown hair. Noticed her foot. Stick it in the binder, and then you, you might be able to pull that out of your pocket in a few months if you're wanting to contact him. Is there a calendar in the binder? Not this one, yeah. but I usually will get like an old one or uh, yeah. like at the end, and then new part of the year there's free ones from like Auto Pack or whatever. Yes. I'll grab that and I'll have yeah. an extra one. And I often will forget to write everything in there immediately because yeah. children. Um, but I will go in my phone and after, like about two months or three months after, everything's in my phone and I'll just rewrite it on there. Yeah. Well, yeah, I called so and so doctor the day before the IEP or that other meeting yeah. and I just write it on there. Very good, and bring and bring bring it bring the calendar with you then. If, bring it, does, if it doesn't live in the binder and it's, it lives on the fridge, stick it in the binder when you go. I was at an IEP the other day. This early in the school year was odd, but I tell you, they wanted to set, uh, and it was an actual IEP with agenda items, but they wanted to set meetings once a month every four weeks for all of us to get together to look at the progress of this child. And I had my day timer with me, and I tell you, I was glad because. There was 11 of us around the table and they wanted the majority of us to be there. And one of the dates in February something, I knew I wasn't available because I have a staff meeting that day. And I said, oh, I can't make it that day. And they picked another day. If I hadn't had my calendar with me, I wouldn't have been able to make that February meeting. Um, so bring the calendar. Is there any such thing as the need too much information? No, no. Because no. I, there was one year yeah. when I was first new to this, my son was only in grade one. Sure. And I brought this, size of a binder. He was only in grade one. Yeah. Because I keep everything as long and as, then another one. As long as I you, didn't pull cool stuff out, but I had it there and I lost it on the table. As long as you bring it and it's your information. You're not gonna bring it in here. You all look through this and oh, no. you all need to read this. No, it was more yes. so because I didn't know what they were gonna ask for. Yeah. 
and organize it with paper clips so that you know that this is all doctor stuff. This is all that developmental is stuff. <laughs> Perfect. That's very good. But if you can't organize it, that's okay. It's all in one book, and and it's. I mean, you'll find what you need in there. If it's just a, it's just the keeping it together that's the important part. So Angela's kind of handed out this IEP binder checklist. Uh, it's probably too teeny to read up here, so I'm glad we handed one out. So this is this is taken from a web page understood.org. I like it. Use it if you like it. Recycle it if you don't. Uh, use the parts you like. Uh, one thing, always ask for, if there's a handout going around at the table and you're not given one, that's not right. You have to be given a copy of whatever's being handed out at the table. That does happen occasionally because the school is so focused on doing their plan that they forget you kind of need to know about what's going on in that plan. Ask for a copy and if they say they're going to get you one, make sure they follow up on that. There's a contact list also if you want to hand that out. It's something else to put in your binder. So this is similar. If there's no business cards, a lot of the OTs and PTs don't have a business card at the table, but they'll be able to say their name and, and uh, you can hand this page over to them and say, could you, could you write your contact information for me, please? And um, at the beginning of every IEP, the first thing that they will start with is a sign-in sheet. Um, and on the sign-in sheet, everybody who's there will be writing their name, their email address, and their phone number. You can ask for that sign-in sheet um, and while, while they're at the meeting, uh, because you've signed it, right? And you can look at it and then fill in your sheet with the contact information if you like. Step two, build your team. So know who is on your team. This is, this is, this is your child's team. It's not Greenway team, this is, this is your child's team. Um, and they're there to support, so think of it like that. So understanding the role of each person is sometimes confusing when there's so many people at the table. Why is the principal here? Why is the vice principal here? Why is the special ed resource teacher here? Um, you can ask these questions right at the meeting, but sometimes it's best to ask the special ed resource teacher afterwards. Hey, so how come the, t the principal is at the meeting? Like, that's kind of weird. But the principal likes to come to the meeting because they want to know how the children are being supported in their school. Some schools, the principal is always at the meeting. Others, I don't know the principal. Um, Especially if it's more of a behavioral thing. True, yes, because they want to make sure their students are safe, not just your your child, but the other students as well. Well, if kids have a big, you know, behavior issue, then one of the people that's being pulled in to deal with the child is the principal. And the principal is the person who has the power to sign off on things that other staff in the school don't. So if the principal, if, if the school, if the student's being sent home, or the plan is that the child is only going to be attending for an hour and 15 minutes this week, and an hour and a half next week, and two hours the week after, the principal has to sign off on that sort of a thing, uh, because it has to do with the child's attendance and valid uh, and, and authorizing it. So your, your child has a role in this. Their, their voice may not be in the room and the child may not be even able to speak or old enough to have a voice, but you know your child and, and, and keep that in mind when you're having this meeting. Your role is often to listen, often to say not too much, but definitely to be there. Um, if you feel like, ah, this is the third IEP I've been to and I love my school, it's all going great, I don't need to go, please go. It's twice a year. Um, if it's difficult for your work schedule or your life, ask for the IEP to be scheduled at a different time. Ask for it to be very first of the day or very last of the day if, if, that, if that works better for you. If they're just going to tell you when the time is and you absolutely can't make it, ask them, ask them to change it. Say, I really, really would like to be there. Um, and if they just can't, then send somebody. Send somebody in, in, in your place and let the school know that I'm, I'm sending um, Auntie Beth, who's not really Auntie. She's my best friend, but I've asked her to be there for me. School team members, non-school team members. Uh, there's not very many times where people from outside the school would be attending an IEP. The only time that commonly happens is when a child also attends daycare, and I like it when the daycare is invited. That's often the parent's responsibility to bring the daycare staff person. Uh, but please, if your child is also going to a daycare program, it's good continuity to let the daycare director know that your child has an IEP meeting coming up, and you're going to let the school know who is coming from the daycare, um, a representative from the daycare, because there's suggestions, and you, you, would be, you, you would laugh how many times at an IEP, the daycare staff goes, he does what at school? He hasn't done that at daycare in months. 
or vice versa because kids will pull one over on you and, and it's nice for everybody to be on the same page. So, yeah. The purpose, what is the purpose? We talked a bit about that already, but the, it, it, it's really a function of the school to make sure that their funding and dollars are being used in their school properly. Uh, that's the, the that's kind of the cold side of the purpose of an IEP, um, but the parental side is for your voice to be heard amongst all the team. So be prepared, even if it's only when you're walking to get to the school. Think about what is my goal in this meeting. What do I want to have heard? What is my what, what is my main point here? Hopefully, it's just that I want to say thank you, and and you know when my kid comes home pooped and tired, I know he had a great day. Thank you or that one thing that's been bugging you that it happens over and over. How can I phrase it nicely when I walk in? How can I, and when am I going to get my chance to say it? Is it gonna be right when I'm introducing myself or after the meeting's over? Think about those things as you're on your way there to get prepared. Take notes, take small notes because you might, if you don't have your support person or the child's other parent or your own parent that you wanna repeat things about, take a couple notes um, if, if you're comfortable doing that. Follow up is always the most important thing. Follow up, what's the point of having a meeting if we're not gonna follow up on some of these things? Um, in real estate, it's location, location, location. In school support, it's follow up, follow up, follow up. Um, so what does follow up mean? If somebody says they're gonna do it, follow up and see if they did it. Uh, if, if we're going to aim for getting the kid to go to swimming outside of the school, and it's taking uh, the city bus with the one-to-one -one support person, uh, and three months later you hear they've been going swimming but they're walking to get there, ask about the home plan. What about the taking the bus part? There's some lesson in there. You know, follow up on all the parts of, of the plan. And uh, ask on that note, yeah. I was just thinking, um, when you follow up, like I would take uh, a note to myself, I called the school on yeah. September 18th and yeah. talked to so-and-so and they said, yeah. And then, when, and then you can if something didn't go, and you can say, but I, I called you on this day, and I oh, yeah, and write it on your calendar. And write right it there. down if you're gonna. We yeah. do, I mean, we did that as as a school as yeah. we're talking to a parent. Yeah. And if any call to a parent would be yeah. everything was recorded, what you said. Yes. And everything else, and it's yes. so be the same way back. For okay. sure. Yeah, that's a great, great, great idea because if I call a teacher on Tuesday and talk to her and say. Uh, he came home with no underwear on. Uh, can, can you can you do okay? And then I I would write that on my calendar. And a week later, when I call the second time, I would write it again, so that the third time when you call, you can say to the principal, I called and spoke to Miss Smith on the fifteenth and the second, and there there must be some other challenge going on because it's it's not gotten any better. And it's always good when you have dates to back up your calls, for sure. And that's the measurable part, make it measurable. So there, you, you put a time limit to things and you can write on the calendar in the future. Uh, I'm gonna call to ask about such and such come November because I remember last year we had a problem when snow started to fly. So I'm writing myself a note early November to call and remind the teacher about this issue or whatever. Write notes for yourself on your calendar too. Uh, yeah, and ask how you can help. Ask how you can help at the IEP. When, when, when it's all said and done, and all these plans are, 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 are set, ask, ask what you can do at home to carry over some of these things, and you might get a few surprise looks like, oh, yes, you know what? Now that you're asking, I'm gonna send you home uh, some copies of these other math sheets that you can do. Thank you for asking. You, you'll, 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 you'll get some, some support there for sure if you ask what you can do to carry on with the plans that are going on at school. Go ahead. Is, um, is there a outline of how to go about so that you're not coming across as why didn't you do this? Just what you said. Um, <laughs> just to okay. think about. Just um, to think about. I have something for that too. Yeah. yeah. How to mm -hmm. communicate in a, in a in a so you don't we have all come things. across as being bitchy basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, with the fact that uh, if the school is saying, yeah, we're gonna do this, and yeah, we're gonna, yeah. you know, we're gonna send you home, home a social story, and then you find out they wrote the social story, they're using it at school, but they didn't yeah. follow through on saying it home. Fair, that's a good point, and that's, uh, that's part of the follow-up, right? So, so you send a note, 
Can I get a copy of that social story? How many times do you send a note before you? Well, you, you escalate it a little higher. You let it go for two days and you write on your calendar. Monday, sent note. Wednesday, sent email. Friday, phone the school. Monday, stop by the school. Mm -hmm. So escalate it a little bit with a smile, but determination. Go ahead. It just makes me think about having a communication journal. Lots of kids have communication books and it's sometimes difficult to get it written in because at the end of the day, the EA is helping three kids, and where is it, and, and it wasn't read, and I wrote in there he puked this morning and nobody saw that, and sometimes it brings a lot of frustration, but it should always be, a, it, it, it's something that's very valuable and it should be tried. Um, and if it can be at least signed weekly, you can ask for the EA, can we initial back and forth weekly? Because my house is, is busy, but I'll commit to initialing it at least once a week. Can you, can you yeah. do the same for me? And then that, that gives it that measurable piece as well, so that the EA can even plan ahead. Oh, poop, it's Friday, I didn't look at that. I better initial that. Oh, it's her birthday next week, I didn't know. You know, to give it something measurable. Oh, I yeah. thought that communication book was something I'm supposed to be written in every day. No, well, I mean, it might be part of a behavior plan if there's issues that are challenging. Because my um, or health issues. Daily, my daughter, yeah. what, they, they put it as a weekly, and I, didn't, yeah. I thought that they all were supposed to be daily. No. No, it's all, but, but, but for some, it's written in part of the plan yeah. and part of the learning plan, especially if there's any medical needs or behavior issues that we want to be consistent at home and school. So a lot of kids, it's a tool that's used daily and it's really necessary, but others, it's... Okay. it's, it's so they might, you, you're saying that they might have made hers a weekly because she doesn't have a behavior plan, she sure. just has an IEP. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Yeah. Is this what you handed out? No. No, I, I handed out a document about communication. Oh, good. Um, because it is really challenging sometimes. We're working with professionals who are really busy. Yeah. And they are supervising 25 kids. Yes. And it's it's tough for us when we're dealing with all the things we're dealing with at home to keep calm and patient and kind. Yeah. So I have some tips. Perfect. Yeah. And I've heard so many parents say, I'm scared that if I let loose on the parent, uh, on the teacher, that they're going to hate my kid. Or I can tell you that that's not true because I've had that. Or they're going to take it out on my kid. Oh, it's just scary. <laughs> yeah, plan it out, make an appointment, be positive and calm, share your knowledge. Yeah, for sure. Share what has and hasn't worked. Be clear, not critical. Show examples, and that's part of your binder. You can yank it out of there. Uh, look at that. He's been spelling his name since July, and they may not have known that. To show it. Talk about your child's strengths. Share information. Ask how you can help. Yeah. There you go. These are just some things I'm not going to go through every point because I'd rather us chitty chat at the end here. We've only got a couple of slides left. But um, these are some of the questions that people commonly have about, you know, what, what, what do the scores and marks mean on my, on my child's IEP? How would you describe my child's learning style? These are some examples of questions that you might have. more questions. Have my child's class assignments been completed? Uh, has my child been attending class regularly? Most of you have little ones, but attendance is a good question when they're teenagers. Uh, what can be done at home to support my child's learning? And what is educational assistance role? There's some more questions to think about. Manitoba League for Persons with Disabilities top 10 tips on good advocacy practices. Uh, I don't know if that's too teeny. Oh no, it's good big. Uh, because IEP, this is your chance to advocate, right? Remember that uh, you as a citizen have every right to present your views, do not be timid or apologetic. Uh, know your facts, always be courteous and polite, never give up, it's the squeaky wheel which gets the wheeze. Uh, this is just web pages I think are on these two. Yeah, so I'll leave it up on here for afterwards if you want. These are not specific about IEP uh, meetings, but just more advocacy that the meeting survival guidance, health help for parents. Um, yeah, so you can come up and write those down after if you like. But